Good evening. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to being there, revisiting Tuesday Evenings at the Modern, the museum's online alternative to its long-running Tuesday Evening Lecture Series. Now in week four of this online alternative, I'm glad to report that I'm finding a rhythm in my new normal, and these Tuesday Evening Gatherings are an important contribution. I hope the same is true for you. As I have mentioned each week, we are um, disappointed that current circumstances required us to indefinitely postpone our remaining live spring 2020 Tuesday evening lectures. But what we have learned in the process of reconfiguring, an apt term someone coined in the last, um, last week's live chat, um, has been invaluable. I have never been so thankful, so proud of our vast Tuesday evening archive. It is an abundantly rich holding that is serving us well and will, I hope, be a source for many of you long after this moment of isolating, of seeking thoughtful ways to be with ourselves and each other as we collect around our computers in this 7 to 8 p.m. time frame on Tuesdays. Tonight, we look back at the artist um, Jenny Holzer's December 2012 presentation that preceded the debut of the modern's Kind of Blue the amazing piece installed against the water in Gallery 4E. Holzer's presentation is rich in imagery and content as she takes us through a career that is now long enough to have an instructive history for those also in the process of being artists, as well as offering insight for anyone seeking to understand how an artist's work um, develops over the years. Working with text um, of her own and of others, this is a research-based practice of elegant and profound interventions um, that is best understood in hearing Holzer's simultaneously self-deprecating and self-assured presentation, altogether charming and enlightening. As we prepare to begin, I would like to note that this is the fourth of four lectures, all by strong women, and that is by design. Not by design, but by coincidence. Um, all of these lectures are from before um, the museum was posting um, video podcasts for Tuesday evenings. The visuals were maintained for archive purposes alone. So the quality is different than the more recent video podcast you can now find on the Modern's uh, YouTube channel. That said, they are just fine for our purposes, and this one is particularly good. Thanks to the foresight and hard work of John Knuckles, who has been an important partner in the Tuesday evening endeavor since 2002. So, just wanted to get in that shout out. Um, as mentioned, there is a live chat available after each of these presentations for anyone who chooses to stick around. Um, so with that, let's begin. Tonight is the la last lecture for the fall 2012 season, um, and it is the grandest of finales. We have Jenny Holzer here. Um, she is here in conjunction with the much anticipated um, installation, Kind of Blue, that is to be unveiled at the Modern's Anniversary Gala um, this Thursday evening and opens to the public on Friday. Um, internationally recognized for her um, daring approach to public art and her thoughtful and dynamic site-specific installations in museums and galleries across the globe, Jenny Holzer has made an enormous contribution to expanding the potential of art um, with original and broad texts that, that affirm the power of language by way of selection, context, and presentation. Students of Jenny's work know that, she, that it began in the late 1970s with anonymous postings around New York. She received her MFA from RISD and at the same time completed um, the prestigious Whitney Independent Study Program in 1977. She has since gone on to present her astringent ideas, arguments, and sorrows in public places and international exhibitions um, with a CV that is literally a mile long. I'm convinced if you laid it out, it would be a mile long. Um, there is um, the floating text that fills the lobby of Seven World Trade Center, the ceiling of running text in uh, Mies van der Rohe's New National Gallery in um, Berlin, and, the pres and a presence at at least two Venice Biennales. She has had solo exhibitions and made projects for sites and museums, including the Guggenheim Museums in both uh, New York and Bilbao. 
the Whitney Museum of American Art, the MoMA, Mass MoCA, the Contemporary Art Museum of Chicago, the city of um, Leipzig, um, the University of Pennsylvania, the DIA Foundation, and the ICA of London, to just name a few. In 1990, uh, Michael Opping was commissioner curator for the American Pavilion of the 44th Venice Biennale. And as such, he chose Jenny Holzer to represent the US, making her the first woman to do so. They went on to win the Leon de Oro, the prize for best pavilion. As one would suspect, Jenny has been recognized with numerous awards, such as the Skohegan Medal for Installation from the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 1994, the Crystal Award from um, the World Economic Forum in 1996, uh, a Berlin Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Berlin in 2000, the Cooper Union Urban Visionary Awards in 2006, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art Award for Distinguished Women in the Arts in 2010, and both the Bernard Medal of Distinction and the Americans for the Arts Outstanding Contributions to the Arts Award in 2011. Jenny holds honorary degrees from um, Ohio University, Williams College, Rhode Island School of Design, the New School, and Smith College. And of course, this could go on all night, but what lies ahead is what matters, and it's what you came for. So would you please join me in welcoming Jenny Holzer. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your coming tonight, and I'll try not to put you to sleep, at least immediately. <laughs> so. Um, because I'm older than the hills, we're going all the way back to the 70s for the first pieces. Uh, I'd been in grad school in Providence, and I'd made any number of terrible abstract paintings. I'd made a bunch of inscrutable public art projects, including asking pigeons to eat geometric shapes. Uh, <laughs> I was lost, in other words. Um, and then happily, just about when RISD was going to evict me, I w was able to enter the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. There, um, my sense of relief passed when I was presented with a prodigiously long reading list. And from that, I distilled the truisms, uh, the first sentences that started to make some sense and helped me you know, fight my way out of the wilderness. So I had these sentences, but then I was still lost. I didn't know what to do with them. They weren't poetry. They weren't uh, a novel. I thought, well, maybe they could be a street poster. So. Here they are on the street. And here they are being dismissed by the public. <laughs> it's a, a good thing about working in public that people are very frank with you, you know. <laughs> In this case, people would go through and you know check ones that they liked and appreciated, and then finally dismiss the entire enterprise as unmentionable. <laughs> Um, this was my first official public art project. We're in a bank in Wall Street now. And I had put the posters up, and they were anonymous for many years. And then I was invited to come inside, and I was quite excited until my piece was taken down after just a couple of days, landed in the janitor's closet because somebody found a sentence that said, it's not good to live on credit. <laughs> So that was that, but uh, I was right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, truisms also went to Times Square. Um, at this point, I was able to put the text on the board at one Times Square, um, and so I picked things that I thought could be interesting there. A serious one. And then a really, really serious one. <laughs> Here is the wonderful artist, Lady Pink, who was one of the few women who would uh, jump fences and ride on trains uh, and do most anything she ever wanted to do. She's uh, nice enough in this shot to um, model one of my t-shirts. Truisms were good for t-shirts. These. 
sentences were written from many, many points of view. I wanted to address as many topics as I could, but not do it from one, um, yeah, one political position. Um, I wanted to see if I could make, in a way, a portrait of people um, to portray, to write what a, a room full of people might really be thinking if they were honest about what they were thinking. Here's uh, one of the paintings I made with Lady Pink. Uh, she made the image, I made the text. Uh, this is probably early 80s by now. Scary painting. We're in Vegas now. <laughs> Doesn't say what kind of taste. <laughs> Lots of it, anyway. Uh, on the baggage carousel, if you wanted your bag, you, have, you were subjected to any number of cliches. Baseball now. <laughs> Mets and Giants. Mets won. <laughs> and this was interesting. Uh, the Boo Birds came out when this uh, showed up. Uh, there was lots and lots of booing. Otherwise, as far as I could tell, everybody was indifferent to the appearance of art when they were trying to watch a baseball game, but this made people mad. Uh, stone benches. After I worked with street posters for a while and worked on the electronics, I thought a good goal in life would be to provide more seating, both in museums, where I'm always wanting to sit down, or in public places. Um, I also wanted to use a medium that's quite different from posters that are ephemeral or electronic signs where the text is running, running, and you can't catch up with it. It's kind of interesting to do what this little girl's doing, and that's to trace letters with your hand and um, know the content another way. This is um, a picture, another mixed review, you see. <laughs> A mixed message. Um, this is one of the inflammatory essays. After I wrote the truisms and assembled all of those one-liners and alphabetized them on posters um, and uh, showed them together so they could uh, fight one another, I tried to expand. I tried to write things exactly 100 words uh, long and 20 lines and I would put them up. This was a good all-purpose one, a good lady one. Don't talk down to me. Don't be polite to me. Don't try to make me feel nice. Don't relax, and on. The posters were quite different when they were shown inside. Outside, no one knew who was writing them and to what end. These posters were anonymous. But when they were inside, I collected them and put them together um, and let them rage at one another. This is the manifesto show that I realized with another artist, uh, Colleen Fitzgibbon. Colleen and I were members of a group called Collaborative Projects, and this was a wonderful group to fall into. Um, we were 20-ish, 30-ish, um, new to New York, and found support with one another. Even though our work was quite different, we were interested in trying to identify subjects that could mean things to people, and then put them outside where everyday people might come across them instead of um, um, requiring people to come to museums. Um, here's Joe Lewis uh, talking, yelling. And we had manifestos that were written and uh, ones that were painted. Next series, the living series. I thought I would go from um, kind of underground things like the posters to, um, <laughs> Don't laugh at my art, come on. <clears throat> to cast plaques, I thought I would use an official medium, um, you know, the sorts of things that are put on historic sites or doctor's offices. And then I'd put things that had to do with daily life, like drooling, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sobbing and drooling, that's something. This is the other way that the living texts were presented. Um, these were hand-lettered signs done by a guy who did restaurant menus. Uh, so he and I collaborated to make these pieces. Um, this is one that was uh, true in the 80s and unfortunately kind of true now. Um, 
affluent students um, are sadly facing reduced prospects. Uh, here's one about uh, what happens some days. It's just the suspicion. <laughs> Uh, finally, back to Times Square. Um, advice to self. <laughs> Somehow I think my mother had something to do with this as <laughs> much else. Um, I went back to the Spectacolor board and put up something from this series, the Survival Series. This was the first group of texts that were written explicitly um, for electronic signs. A lot of the other things, like the truisms I'd recycle and use in everything from a tractor hat to, you know, I don't know, a bench, uh, these sentences were written for signs. <coughs> Here's the <a> sign. <laughs> Um, in the early 80s, after I had the most excellent adventure at Times Square, I went to the Yellow Pages and found some electronic signs of my own, little guys. So I learned how to program them and would sit at the kitchen table and um, make the signs light up. Um, that was nice. A tough one. A nicer one. Um, when Nelson Mandela was released for prison, from prison, any number of artists and poets and musicians gave him a welcome out and birthday party. And this was the sentence that um, I contributed to the board. This is Wembley Stadium. Ah, uh, if you can stand a little election stuff. Um, I apologize, <laughs> there's been a lot. This was in 84. Uh, a number of artists and I did sign on a truck. It was technology that then was very glamorous and new and had only been seen in New York, uh, I think for a Diana Ross concert in Central Park. So we had videos by artists and we also had MCs uh, roaming the crowd and giving people a chance to speak, not necessarily on this candidate or that <coughs> candidate, but on the issues that they hoped uh, would come to the fore uh, in the discussion about the election um, and would talk about what they feared would happen in the country or what they most earnestly desired would take place. Um, so. Here we have our MC talking to a lady from New York who was talking to a man from Missouri and he was saying Reagan was absolutely perfect and the lady from New York is saying, what are you nuts? So this is the sort of uh, back and forth that happened. And I've got a little uh, time travel video for you. What do you feel strong about? President Reagan, I like what's in uh, my wallet. I wanna keep it. Ronald Reagan. But I don't want a woman in the White House. She's a dummy. Well, I'm definitely against Reagan because he don't know anything about being poor. He's an actor. He is always acting. If he had to live the way I had to live, then he could understand compassion. But he has no compassion. And I'm deadly against him to be in turn for another four years. We want to register our support of Mondale, Marta and I. And I want to vote for Mondale for her sake. And for your own. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice star turn by Oldenburg. <laughs> it was nice that he came to the party. Uh, next series, this is the Under a Rock uh, text. I took a turn to the dark side. I wrote text about unmentionable things, things that uh, seemingly crawled out from under rocks. I went to benches again because uh, benches seem good homes for this kind of material. And if nothing else worked in the art department, you could still sit down, you know, that's <laughs> merciful. I uh, set these up um, as a composition, you know, so it looked like a, a waiting room, perhaps uh, some unholy bus station. Uh, and I had text at the front going by. The, Electronic signs let me include a lot of material, much more than I could otherwise. I began to appreciate the brains of these signs, that they could hold so much and represent it. <coughs> We're at DIA Foundation. We're in the late 80s now. Um, this 
series of writing, The Laments, uh, came to be about uh, the AIDS epidemic that was ravaging New York by the late 80s. I'd started the series writing about unnecessary death from many reasons, reasons from bad politics to all kinds of things, um, but then this um, came to be focused on AIDS, uh, about love and loss. The text here would rise on 13 electronic signs. And then in another room, a side room, were 13 coffins with um, texts that uh, were as if written by the people in the coffins, you know, the last thing that was said, desired, uh, uh, wanting to be conveyed. I was working from the common sad human impulse that when tragedy strikes, um, people will line uh, things up, you know, to restore some sense of order. Um, so that's what I did there. This is the uh, text with, um, about AIDS. The new disease came. I learned that time does not heal. And it goes on from there. To the Guggenheim. Also late 80s, I was a complete fool about this installation, as often is the case. I had said very boldly, oh, why doesn't anyone use the Guggenheim as an installation room? You know, it's, it's so hostile as a museum, people should use it as a funhouse of sorts and make work specifically for it. So I had that brave pronouncement, but then when I was invited to do something, I had no clue about what to do because the architecture was so strong and so good that I just felt like limping away. Um, so I limped around and around for a while and then finally realized, oh, um, the architecture is so strong and so perfect, I should go with it. So um, with that in mind, I did go round and round again with electronic signage um, and the text could travel the length of, I think, three ramps. I also put some benches there so if you were tired of um, seeing text swirl around your head, you could park. Here are those benches with people parking. Here's one of the round ones from the floor. Use what is dominant in a culture to change it quickly. That's as close to philosophical as I get. And I like this picture because it shows the benches working and you know people looking at one another and looking at the architecture and um, looking at the text going by. This is a happy image. We're in Venice now. Uh, once again, I was um, absolutely clueless about what to do when selected to represent the United States. I had been an anonymous street artist um, it was uh, peculiar to be an official artist. Um, it was also worrisome to be the first female because, you know, if I was especially bad, as, you know, often as possible, uh, you know, I could embarrass like half the people in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I did um, after, you know, freezing was to go around Venice quite a bit and look for materials and forms and content that could make sense there. I went to Italian stone and I made floors like many other Venetian floors. Here are people looking at the floors. And then I, since I'd um, managed, since I'm a female artist, um, I'd managed to have a baby in the middle of, uh, somewhere in the middle of the Guggenheim and um, Dia and Venice. And so I wrote a text, not strictly autobiographical, but a, about having babies and, and worrying about babies and worrying about the world relative to babies. Um, uh, so this was my mother and child text. Um, seemed like a good place to do a Madonna text. And here's the other uh, room in the pavilion. I made two antechambers where you could sit on benches and think your thoughts uh, modeled on the rooms in the Doge's palace where one would go to await your audience with the Doge and then, you know, go to prison or get, um, you know, the ability to go on a trading mission. When one came into the second room, you would see 
too many electronic signs with too many languages and too much programming, um, and the floor literally would seem to give way beneath you. It was highly uh, reflective, and so you would see the electronics in infinite regress uh, under your feet. All right, we're in Germany. This is, um, well, who knows when it was, <laughs> sometime during my lifetime. <laughs> um, uh, a very interesting project in the little city Nordhorn in the north of Germany. The mayor there wanted to make an anti-memorial. He was tired of war memorials. He wanted uh, to have created a cautionary memorial, a dink bomb. So, I went and he gave me a little park that had unfortunately been a rallying place for the National Socialist. Um, it was used as a place to uh, drum up support to go to war again in World War II. The mayor wanted something different, so I made a black garden um, with unnaturally dark uh, plants. Um, so as soon as you entered this acre or so, you knew something was tough, you knew something was off, you would feel it. Um, I had benches there, so there were some text about war, uh, but mostly, um, and somewhat atypically for me, your knowledge of war didn't come from reading, it came from seeing. Another difficult piece, um, during the war in the former Yugoslavia, rape became um, a weapon of war once again, in this case uh, unapologetically and officially. Um, um, this was astonishing to me that this was happening in Europe at this time. So when I had a chance to make something for the cover and for 20 or 30 pages of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, I wrote the Lustmord series, written from the points of view of the perpetrator, of the victim, and of an observer who comes afterwards and has to restore the rule of law. Um, I wrote those texts. Um, I had them printed in an ink made in part from blood. Um, this piece also was different from me. I'm usually not completely literal with my materials, but. Uh, this was a crime against the body, and so it seemed to make sense to go to blood and skin. Inside the magazine were pictures of these texts um, written on people. I am awake in the place where women die, was a text I wrote early and focused the piece. And a bit later, I made tables, loose moored tables, made uh, in part from, or showing uh, human bones with little bands of silver with the awful, awful writing on it. Bill Bow now, very different situation. Uh, I was lucky to be invited to work in the building when it was still in its planning stages. So I was able to go and see it when it was still steel and try to figure out what to do in a wavy gravy building, a building with um, very few, if any, right angles and lots of curves. Um, I'm kind of a rigid sort, so I didn't know what to do with a gallery that was doing that. <laughs> so um, I resorted to being rigid and put signs uh, straight across it in a straight line on the Outside um, were text in Spanish and English, and inside were text in the f once forbidden Basque language, um, <coughs> things that uh, couldn't be said and certainly couldn't be said in that language. Oh, here we have a little surrealism, um, not usually my forte, but um, here's an example of how odd things happen. In this case, Mariah Carey happened. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so it's worth waiting around, and sometimes, the, you know, you see the darndest things. <laughs> uh oh, did Mariah freeze us? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Back to sobriety, we're in the uh, Bundestag. Um, 
this was a fascinating and really, really tough project. Um, when the German parliament moved from Bonn back to P Berlin after many, many years, a number of artists were given commissions to do um, what they felt um, appropriate. I was given the politician's entrance. Um, and that once again had me freeze and not know what to do. I finally came up with the idea of going to the archives of the Bundestag and finding what politicians from various parties had said over the decades. I traced certain themes, uh, such as the boundaries of Germany, such as the role, such as the role of women in society, and I um, transcribed um, these statements and had them appear on the sign. Uh, so I thought this would be something for the politicians to see on their way to work. Berlin again, um, the Neue National Gallery, uh, a beautiful, beautiful bit of architecture like the Guggenheim in New York, self-sufficient, doesn't like art, doesn't need art. Um, <laughs> the architect made a funny, he only put coat rooms on the main floor, he put the art in the basement. <laughs> so um, I didn't know what to do for the longest time, but then I thought, oh, I will use the beams in the ceiling because these are um, some of the few elements uh, here, and if I join the architect, he won't beat me. So. <laughs> This building was tremendously generous in that um, the glass let the piece copy and copy itself and in some cases made it look as if these texts were going off into infinity. There's the museum looking a little bit like a nightlight. It was um, lovely at night. The ceiling um, seemed to melt everything, and we had interesting programming. Sometimes we could make the ceiling seem as if it uh, were bowing, or sometimes uh, making an arch. Um, <coughs> it's fun programming electronics. Um, here are some of my attempts to make sculpture. Um, I was very 2D for the longest time and then relatively late uh, started to try to see if I could make things uh, multi-dimensional, not just have time as my buddy, but you know have space as a potential pal. Uh, you can't tell with this image particularly, but this piece is slanted, canted, and um, I think it helped it. This one's in the round. I borrowed some poetry from my friend, the wonderful American poet, Henri Cole. And this is um, an excerpt from a poem, Beach Walk. Here's a crisscross piece. Um, I started using corners. This is another poem by Henri Cole. Ah, projections. Um, this has been my hobby and habit um, since I guess the middle of the 90s, I ran into an old roadie who had a beat up projector. And for the art and fashion biennale, we engaged him to project text um, across the Arno River. We were in the Canoe Club of Florence and ended up uh, projecting on, as you can tell by the red light, a house of ill repute. We didn't know it at the time, <laughs> but we were shining a text about love and loss on a house of love. <laughs> so, um, this is a, a pretty sad text, first um, crafted for an AIDS fundraiser, um, but then it became more generalized and came to be about losing anyone you love, and then you maybe have just a little something left, like you know the smell of somebody on your skin or the smell of someone on a bit of clothing that you have. Projection in Brazil. Sometimes we can make it really big. More in Brazil, we were busy 
feeling important, <laughs> projecting on the mountain, and then a storm came up, and we had enough sense to swivel the projectors so we could catch the waves, and this made a wonderful pacing as the waves would come at fairly regular but slightly uh, erratic intervals, and the text would go across the sand and then um, appear on the waves. The waves would crash, the text would be quite white in the foam. We were happy then. In Venice, uh, Venice was hospitable. The water is extremely dirty. Having a lot of dirt in the water makes for great reflections. Thank you, Venice. Oh, on the um, Jewish Museum in Berlin, before it opened, the staff was kind enough to invite us to do a projection on the outside um, to start to show the collection on the skin of the building, on the Liebeskin building, uh, before anybody could go inside. So we, with the help of the museum staff, we pulled documents and so on that could uh, scroll on the screen, the screen that was the building. Monterey, Mexico. This was the love projection. Paris on the Pantheon. More Paris. Paris is most hospitable. <laughs> the Alps in Austria. This was the big, big projection. New York City on the New York Public Library. It was an enormous privilege to be able to project on it. Central Park, boom. <laughs> uh, right across from Pennsylvania Station. So when people came out of the basketball game, they got some Zimborska, so you know. <laughs> Rockefeller Center, a wonderful public place. Um, unlike some projection sites, uh, people could sit down here and not be mown over by traffic. <laughs> 30 Rock. Strangely, an airport. Can you imagine trying that in this country? <laughs> this was on the control tower. <laughs> so, um, this is by the Palestinian poet Darwish. Elfrida Jelinek, an interior projection. <laughs> she was kind enough to lend me her text. Uh, I recommend her. She is utterly wild, untamable. Uh, California, on the ocean, back to Zimborska. Rome, another really, really dirty river. The Tiber is really stinky, which helped us enormously. Hadrian's tomb, being hospitable. The Israeli poet Amakai. Uh, we had five projectors on the length of the Tiber. It was lovely to see that. Uh, we had poetry by any number of poets from, from around the world scrolling simultaneously. There you can get some kind of sense of it. We're in DC now. Um, from the back porch of the Kennedy Center onto Roosevelt Island, we had text by Kennedy and by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, we found any number of text by Roosevelt on nature. I knew just a little bit about his interest in conservation and so on, and I knew a lot more after doing this research. This is a good thing. Back in Poland, um, I had the privilege, the honor to show Zimborska's text to her before she died. I am so lucky when I'm able to borrow content from people, um, and in this case, show her own writing to her in a different way. This is on her hometown castle. Everybody should have one. <laughs> At the Louvre, this is my kid's picture. I need to say that. <laughs> Not my kid's picture. 
<laughs> At the Guggenheim, um, I'm especially lucky when a building has a shape um, or a particular history, or better yet, uh, a particular history and a shape. So. I like when people take projections home with them. Here's a guy being a Giacometti. <laughs> Szymborska again. I've included these little bits of video because um, most of my stuff moves, or a lot of it does, and so I wanted to show you what it's like when it's rolling. Pittsburgh, a sports and exhibition center. Um, here I chose a number of books. This uh, piece has tons of content. I went to uh, writers who lived in or wrote about Pittsburgh. San Diego, um, a sign, kind of retro looking, but in, it, it includes transcendence. Seven World Trade Center, um, another interesting and very difficult project. It was tempting um, to go to tragedy here, um, but then I thought, no, there's been more than adequate tragedy at this site. It perhaps would um, be better if I went to um, records of excitement about New York when people would first move to the city to begin their, their lives, you know, their creative lives. Um, so I went to text uh, just that, just like that, um, you know, from architects and poets and writers and any number of, or early discoverers, discoverers sailing up the Hudson going, wow, not bad, good real estate. <laughs> So there it is. More sculpture. I kept trying, keep trying. This, this is round sculpture. <laughs> this was a piece in Russia. I tried to make my own version of Tatlin's uh, tower. So this is the electronic latter day version of it. This piece is uh, full of formerly secret documents and um, modeled on the human body on the rib cage. Another crisscross piece. Somebody looking at a crisscross piece. This is a, a newer one. Um, I thought it would be interesting to have signs cut at various angles. Um, this piece is full of transcribed classified documents. Um, during the recent conflict in the Middle East, I, I wasn't seeing everything I wanted to know in the newspapers, so I went to various archives, such as the uh, National Security Archive, and tried to read about what was said in the moment by commanders and soldiers, by detainees, um, by interrogators, uh, by policy wonks, and so on. I, I wanted to read about what people were thinking as they were planning and experiencing and then trying to live afterwards. That's what this piece has. Here's a guy with a beard looking at electronics. <laughs> I don't know why I put him in, but I keep liking this image. <laughs> so. um, back to the declassified documents. Um, it's been so interesting to go to the archives and uh, continue, I guess, my adult education. And sometimes you see things that are reassuring, or in this case, darkly funny. Let's discuss ways to bring peace. Secret. <laughs> 
Um, here's a painting based on um, declassified documents, in this case, one that was wholly redacted. Um, when I first started making these paintings, I was interested in one that had ones that had special content that maybe wasn't known uh, by a lot of people, but then I've started to, um, I guess, become a mock suprematist and um, I'll see what it looks like when you apply color to documents that are mute in a way. Back to the raising boys and girls the same way. This is a little gobo projection. I decided to make some mini projections for uncertain reasons. <laughs> They're easier. <laughs> They're cute. I don't know. <laughs> ah. Local. <laughs> I don't know whether this is cute, but it's big. <laughs> um, an extremely fun project in the stadium. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to put text uh, up on the sign, including during games. So we made these things uh, shout and shriek and shimmy and do all kinds of stuff, but there's a lot of competition there. <laughs> To the limit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sloppy thinking gets worse over time. So that intrudes in the game from time to time. <laughs> so, <laughs> seemed like something to do. <laughs> Oh, and here's the end. Um, this is in the what's next category. I don't know whether I'll be able to pull it off, but someday I hope to do this, and I think there's at least a fighting chance. We're going to try to put an obelisk, an electronic obelisk in the pyramid. So keep your fingers crossed, and it's gonna look like this. Please let it happen. <laughs> so, thank you for your patience and your endurance. <laughs>